time weather. So it's nice to be back and see you folks again. Well, I'm going to do something today that's probably, if you're a Bible expositor, you'd probably scream at me. Um, but we're going to look at a number of passages, and this is often true when you have, when you want to deal with topics in the Word. I, sometimes I think that maybe a good balanced ministry in assemblies is to not only do verse by verse, book by book exposition. That's probably the ideal way of studying the scriptures. But there are times when we like to deal with. I just want to check and make sure you're on there. Oh, okay. You know you're on. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I was just saying that probably the ideal way of teaching the scriptures is go book by book, verse by verse. But I think it's also helpful too to deal with topics in the scriptures. I like to think, for example, the doctrine of redemption, just kind of trace that through the New Testament. Those are really very, very helpful. So I'm going to kind of deal with a topic this morning, and that's going to require us turning to a number of passages. So I hope you don't mind. If you get tired, just sit and look at me, and we'll we'll keep going. But I would like to begin by reading uh, three passages in the book of the Revelation, if you'll turn with me. Uh, first of all, to chapter 11, and we'll read a few verses there, and then turn back to chapter 5. <laughs> and then we're going to turn back to chapter 22. But if you'll look, you'll see a key word in each of these uh, three passages. So we're beginning to read in chapter 11 and verse number 15. <clears throat> then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the little and the and the little came for the dead, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And then if you'll turn back to chapter 5, we'll read some well-known verses as well, chapter 5. And you probably know that chapter 4 and 5 is really a picture of a throne room that's yet to take place yet in the future uh, prior to the tribulation period. And if we could just begin to read at verse number 9, well, verse number 8. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And then the last passage, uh, very quickly, is in chapter 22. We're passing out of time into eternity in this text. So let's begin to read at chapter 22 and verse 1. <clears throat> then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing... Uh, 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every season, and the leaves of the tree were, were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And notice verse 5. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of the lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. 
What was the key word in all three of those passages? Did anyone pick that up? Yeah, the word rain. That's the word rain. You know, I think it's probably true that for most of us, when we think about the afterlife, our thinking gets a little bit fuzzy, doesn't it? Um, I often think of that passage in 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul is writing a great chapter on love. He says, we look through a mirror dimly. And the word dimly there means riddle, or actually our word enigma comes from that original Greek word. And sometimes I think when we think about the afterlife, it's a little bit of an enigma to us. I mean, there are certain things that we do know. We know that we're going to be with the Lord Jesus. We know that we're going to have new bodies. We know that we're going to be uh, present with the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints. We know there's going to be myriads beyond myriads of angels. Those are things that we know. But it seems to me that sometimes there's something else about the afterlife that maybe we miss in reading our New Testaments. And that is that in eternity, we will not only be worshiping, but we will be working. So if you're tired of working this life, forget it, because in the next life, we're really going to be working. But what does the Bible really tell us about this whole concept of reigning? Because it's the desire of the Lord Jesus that in his future messianic kingdom, he wants us to rule and to reign with him. And when time is no more at the end of this thousand year reign and eternity begins, that kingdom will actually continue right on into eternity with one distinct change. And that is that Jesus will give up his reign during the messianic kingdom. He will hand that over to the father and in eternity, the triune God will reign. But believe it or not, he wants us as his people to reign and to rule with him. So I've been thinking about this for several weeks now, and I thought maybe to kind of get it, you know, what is this, what does this ruling look like? How do we know who's going to rule? What kind of criteria does the Lord Jesus rule to determine what it will be like in that, in that future time. So what I did was I kind of wrote out a few questions and we'll try to answer those from scripture. And I hope that it will lead us maybe to the end till we can understand exactly what this ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus really is. And the first question is this, what was God's original intention for man when he put him on the earth? The answer for that is found back in the book of Genesis. So if you will, uh, turn back to chapter one of the book of Genesis, the great chapter on creation. When I uh, kind of approach this chapter, I think of, uh, I, I think of it kind of like God is building a house when he creates the universe. And after he creates the house or builds the house, so to speak, then he creates man and he puts him in the house. So the first 25 verses or so is a record of how God actually created everything, the universe. And then in verse 26, we read these words. Then God said, let us make man in our image. That is, we are moral beings according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created men in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Notice in verse 26, he's to rule in verse 28, he's to subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that, that uh, moves on the earth. So God's original intention for man was that he would rule over all that he had created. Now think about it for a moment. In the original creation, everything was in balance. There were no kind of climates. The animals were always friendly. You know, everything was fine. Everything was absolutely perfect. And so God said to them in that perfect world, to Adam, you know, multiply, 
I want you to produce children. And if that had been true and nothing had happened, then it there would have been a perfect human race. And God's intention was that man actually rule over his creation. He'd be the king of the earth. There was a German theologian by the name of Eric Sauer who wrote a number of books, a little bit on the deep side, but probably some of the best theology books that I have ever had in my library. One of them was called The Dawn of World Redemption, where he deals with the history of salvation in the Old Testament. The Triumph of the Crucified deals with the history of salvation in the New Testament. And then he wrote one um, kind of a, a kind of an expanded view he called from eternity to eternity. And so he traces the history of salvation from the beginning of time to the very end of time. Really excellent books. But the last book that he wrote before he died was one called The King of the Earth. And the whole emphasis in that book was that God intends that in a future time that he wants man to rule with the Lord Jesus over planet Earth and ultimately over the whole universe. In fact, there's a very interesting verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, yes, it's chapter 3, uh, chapter 6, where he's dealing with taking people to the law court, and he says to them, don't you know that you will actually be judging angels? Now, while I don't understand that, part of this future ruling with Christ is going to involve in some way judging angels. But since angels are perfect beings created individually to serve God, you know, that leaves it, it's one of those enigmas. We don't really know exactly, you know, what that will all involve. So God's original intention for man was that he rule over the whole universe. But then something happened. So we ask ourselves, well, what happened? that created that problem, that actually caused man to forfeit his rule over planet Earth. And of course, the answer for that is found in Genesis chapter 3, where man sinned. And when Adam sinned, when he and Eve sinned, then he took to himself an evil disposition. We, disposition, we call that, we call it, theologians like to call that a sin nature. I, I, as I've probably shared with you before, I prefer the word disposition because it means that, you know, as sinners, we're just kind of disposed to do things that are evil. But not only that, but the whole universe that God had created was subjected to futility. And Paul deals with that in Romans chapter 8. And let me just remind you of those verses. You don't have to turn to it because something cataclysmic happened when Adam sinned in the garden, when he and Eve disobeyed God. And Paul deals with that in Romans chapter 8, and this is what he says, because he's looking forward to the revealing of the sons of God. And he says in verse number 19 of Romans 8, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And then he tells us why. For the creation was subjected to futility. And that means that word kind of carries with the idea of frustration. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. And of course, it was God who subjected man, uh, you know, the, the, the creation to, uh, to futility because of Adam's sin and hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So God's original purpose for Adam was that he ruled over all of creation, but Adam forfeited that privilege, that responsibility because of sin. So the question, the next question is, will God ever actually fulfill his original purpose for man? Of course, the answer to that is yes. And we have to turn to the New Testament, get the answer for that. So if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter two, Hebrews chapter two. <clears throat> If we had time to kind of look through the whole of Hebrews 1 and 2, we'd see that the greater context of this book is looking forward to the Messianic kingdom. Well, let me just show you a couple of verses to highlight that in chapter 1. The Lord Jesus has inherited the name as the Messianic son. And notice in verse number 5 of chapter 1, the writer said, and he's, he's really trying to show the superiority of the Lord Jesus over angelic beings. And he says in verse number five, for which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? 
well, obviously he never said that. Today I, today I have forgotten you. And again, <laughs> and again, that's happened to me too, John. So, and again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Notice verse six. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, that's referring to the second advent of Christ. So we're, we're going future now. He says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now we're going forward. He's dealing with the messianic kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. I'm sorry, I missed part of that verse. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. So the kingdom there is looking forward to the time when Jesus will reign during his messianic age, beginning with the second advent. So, but the problem is that the whole world has been subjected to futility now. So how will God fulfill that? Well, drop down with me to chapter 2. And verse number five, he says, for he did not subject to angels the world to come. So the world to come there is looking forward to the messianic kingdom. He's talking about that age when Jesus will actually reign on earth. And he says here that angels will not be put in charge. It's interesting when you think about angels, they have no concept of, of uh family because angels were never born. So they don't have moms and they don't have dads and they don't have uncles and they don't have cousins, but God created every angel individually. And every angel was designed to be his messenger or to serve him. In fact, in the New Testament, if you read carefully, you'll notice that, for example, this morning we read in Luke, when the angel Gabriel was sent from God to Mary, that was a function of an angel. But in that coming age, angels will not be put in rule. They will not be responsible for ruling the universe. So who will be? Well, notice the text. Then David goes on, uh, the writer goes on to say, quoting from the uh, David in Psalm 8, but one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now he's not talking about the Lord Jesus here. He's talking about Adam. But he goes on to say in verse number eight, for in subjecting all things to him, that is God subjecting all things to Adam. He left nothing that is not subject to him. Everything would have been subject to Adam in that perfect environment. But he goes on to say, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. He's indicating that something has happened that Adam forfeited his role and we don't see things as they were originally. But he goes on to say in verse number nine, he gives us the answer. But we do see him who was made a very little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. Now, when he makes that statement, brothers and sisters, he's not talking about bringing us to heaven. He's talking about bringing us to that future messianic kingdom. So the answer to that question is, will God ever for actually fulfill what he originally intended for man? Of course, the answer is yes. And he will do that in the person of his son. When his son comes back, he will set up this kingdom and he will rule from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. So the question is then, how, how is this rain described in the New Testament? Now the word occurs a number of times and we've read three passages. I actually read those three because the first one talks about the Lord Jesus reigning. 
when the seventh angel sound, uh, sounds, that's talking about the very, that's talking about the very uh, uh, end when Jesus rules from sea to sea and rules to the ends of the earth. But I read the other two because in chapter five, it talks about us reigning in time, but the one in chapter two is talking about our reign in the eternal state. So the question is then, if Jesus wants us to reign with him, how does the New Testament describe this kind of reigning? And so I'd like to suggest to you this morning that this reign is really described in terms of rewards. We don't have time to look at all these passages, but let me just remind you of one in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was talking about, you know, <laughs> rejoice when you suffer for righteousness sake, for great is your reward in heaven. And in that context, in the whole book of Matthew, Matthew's looking forward to the Messianic kingdom. So he's linking rewards with that future kingdom. Now, there are a number of other passages. One of the writers that I have always enjoyed over the years is W.E. Vine. Uh, he, he has a book called The Expository Words of the New Testament, which I found very, very helpful over the years. And he, he notices that almost every instance you come across the word reign, in relationship to Christians, he's looking forward to this future messianic kingdom. So these these uh, these rewards will be um, privileges and responsibilities that he will give his faithful followers in that future age. Now these will be based on faithfulness, brothers and sisters. And one of the things that always comes to my mind when I think about this this whole issue, we have to come to deal with for a moment in a moment just about when God will actually give those rewards, when He will give those assignments. But the question often comes to mind is if rewards are based on faithfulness, does it mean that there will be some believers? Who will have no reward they will be in the kingdom but they may not be given responsibility and of course there's not a final answer to that but let me just tell you what one great bible teacher did believe about it and if you'll turn back with me in your bibles to first uh, corinthians chapter four <laughs> when i was first saved way back in 1958 um, I kind of cut my teeth on books by Dr. Harry Ironside and uh, was a great, great help to me back in those days. And in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, he's dealing with chapter 4, and chapter 4 is dealing with the whole concept of stewardship. And uh, let me just read with you, well, let's just read from verse 1 of chapter 4 for context. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. And in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you. I take it from that statement, he was not unduly obsessed with the opinions of others. And he goes on to say, or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Now notice verse number five. Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then the last little phrase of that verse, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now in Dr. Ironside's comments on that verse, based on that, he believed that every believer, there would be something in the life of every believer for which the Lord Jesus would extend a reward. And that very well could be true, but I have to admit, I don't read the verse the same way. I think he's stating a principle. And the principle is that if a man, that each man's praise will come to God if his works are worthy of that reward. So it's possible. But you also have in the same book, another verse that seems to indicate maybe there will be some. Notice with me in chapter three, and let's go down to chapter uh, 14. 
Well, let's begin to read at verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, and in this context, he's probably talking about those who are teaching in the local assembly, but the principle, I think, could be extended. And he says, each man's work will become evident for the day, and that's referring to the Bema Seat of Christ, will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, a metaphor for the holiness of God, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. I think it's really interesting. He doesn't talk about how much, but he does test the quality. Then he goes on to say, verse 14, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. Now the word reward actually means wages, but in a different sense. If any man's work, number 15, verse 15, is burned up, he will suffer loss, loss in the sense of not receiving a reward. And then Paul goes on to say, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. So when you put those two verses together, you realize that we're just not really, really sure. But there's one thing that's certain that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And at that time, he will assign awards. He will give rewards or assign privileges and responsibilities in the kingdom. So in order to kind of see that in its context, let's turn now to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this passage will tell us when these rewards are given, when these privileges and these responsibilities to rule with Christ will actually be given to his people. So we'll read just verses 9 and 10. This is the, really the key passage in the New Testament on the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. And then he tells us why. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now that's really, really a very important verse for all of us. It tells us a number of things. The first things he tells us in verse 10 is that all of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the word judgment in this, and maybe you've studied this at the assembly before, but it actually comes to the Greek word bima. So in, in ancient times, if there was a judgment to be extended, they would bring a, a, someone before a magistrate. He would be sitting on like a throne or something would be set up from which he would extend judgment. And that's the word that Paul is using here. So the whole concept is that of dealing with judgment. And that's probably why our, our versions often translate it judgment rather than using the original uh, Greek word bima. But he says, all of us will appear. And there will be no excuses. We can't send along a note and say, sorry, Lord, we can't be there. Uh, we will all be there without exception. So that means, brother and sisters, for every person who has been godly his whole life, or stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But if those who have backslidden and died in a backslidden state, they will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And the way that we have lived in this life will determine the amount of reward that he gives us at the judgment seat. So that's one thing. Notice what he says too, that each one of us may be recompensed. That's an interesting word. It's really a kind of a, it's kind of a financial word. It, it really means to receive what is due. It's the idea is that of receiving wages. But, but at the judgment seat of Christ, the wages that he gives us in terms of reward is not the same as, you know, like we go off to work and every two weeks, you know, our employers legally bounded to pay us our wages. That, that's a legal issue. But that's not the same sense in which it's used here in the New Testament. The concept here in the New Testament is that the Lord Jesus, out of love and mercy and grace, is saying to us, if you will be faithful to me during the course of your lifetime, out of my grace, I choose to give you a reward. So in that sense, we don't earn it. 
like we earn a wage in this world, but it does mean that we will earn our rewards by the way that we have lived in this life. And then he goes on to, to, to really kind of explain, uh, you know, how the Lord will evaluate this. He says some things will be good or some things will be bad. I think in the old King James Version, I haven't read it for so many years now, I can't remember, but it seems like that they translated, if I remember correctly, good and evil. But the concept here is not moral. It's not ethical. Bad in the sense of not worthy of a reward. So he's telling us that we will be recompensed if our deeds have been good. That is, from his point of view, they have been, they're worthy of a reward. Or if they're bad, they're not worthy of a reward. <clears throat> so that's why when you and I, you know, we enter the afterlife and, and this point in time comes in which he will reign in, his, in the messianic age and he assigns these responsibilities, some of us will probably have more reward than the others. But it won't be the sense in which there'll be have and have nots. You know, if I end up having much less responsibility in that future kingdom, and John has much more, I won't be envious of John. Because I know the Lord will have dealt with me righteously and impartially at the Bema seat. But all of us will be with him in the kingdom, but the extent to which and how much reward we will get actually depends on the way we live in this life. And you know, I, Brother says, I think that's really kind of important to think about because I think sometimes Protestants tend to downplay the importance of works in the Christian life. We understand, don't we, that we're not saved by works. You know, we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're saved by faith. But it's interesting when you turn to the pastoral letters like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, there's a, there's a theme that runs through all three of those letters on the importance of good works in the Christian life. So it is important how we live. It is important how we serve in this life because how we serve in this life will determine the measure of reward that he will give us at the Bema Seat. Now, having said all of that, the question then would be, oh, I forgot to mention this. If we're reigning with him, how does he how does he describe us in that future day? Well, I read that in chapter one of Hebrews. Let me just go back and read that passage one more time one more time with you. Hebrews chapter one and verse number uh, nine. And in verse number nine, the writer says, You have loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Now he's talking to the son in the previous verse. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And I take it that is a reference to the way he lived when he was here on earth. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. So those believers that will be reigning with him in that future kingdom are considered to be his companions. He wants us to rule with him. He wants us to reign with him. He wants us, you know, to have responsibilities in this great kingdom. But again, it will depend on how we live now. Now, and that leads to the last question very briefly is this. How are these rewards described in the New Testament? And in my studies recently, I've kind of come up with, I think there are three ways that they are described, these rewards are described. But keep in mind that the rewards are referring not to some kind of a cosmic crown that he will put on our heads when we arrive in heaven. And if we understand correctly, it may be that the Bema Seat of Christ will take place, you know, soon, soon after we are raptured. If we go before the tribulation period, then it will take place then. And then those assignments will be given. But those rewards are not they're not cosmic things that he will put on his head. It's talking more about responsibilities in that future kingdom. And when I read through the New Testament, I see three things very quickly that, that I think helps us understand what these rewards are. 
But keep in mind that all of them, because most of them cannot really be explained. Bible teachers tried to explain them, but in the end, you know, it's a little bit of an enigma. But at any rate, there are three ways that these places of responsibility are described. And the first is that what we would call special privileges. That is that those believers in this life that are faithful to him, he will out of love and grace give them special privileges in that future kingdom. And if you'll turn with me to the book of the Revelation, just to notice this, these are the verses that, that uh, I would kind of link with this whole concept of special privileges. In chapters two and three, you know, we have the record of the seven churches of Asia. And at the end of each one of those, you remember that the uh, John says to those who overcome, now, I have to be intellectually honest with you, brothers and sisters, by telling you that there are some believers, very well theologians, that believe that every believer is an overcomer. And if every believer is an overcomer, then the promises that are given will be true of every believer. I have a little bit of a problem with that. In the context of each of these, when he's talking about problems in each of these churches, he reminds them that if they have ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, if you know what's true, then you should obey it. And then he issues these overcoming rewards. So I take it that the overcomers are referring to believers in this life who overcome and seek to live for the Lord's glory during the course of their lifetime. But let's just notice some of these privileges very quickly. Don't have time to talk about them, but notice with me in chapter two, verse seven. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Drop down to the same chapter to verse number 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Now that one's easy to understand because in chapter 20, we know that the second death is referring to the lake of fire. So we're assured in overcoming that we will not be cast into the lake of fire. So that one's a little bit easier to understand. Chapter, verse 17 of chapter two. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So there's a privilege attached to the overcoming. I'm not sure what it means, but this is the promise he's given us. Drop down with me. Uh, to verse number 26, same chapter. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds unto the end, I take that to the end of their life, to him I will give authority over the nations. Now that one's clear too. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. So authority in that future age is again linked with overcoming in this life. Chapter three and verse number five. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There's another privilege, a little bit difficult to explain. Drop down in the same chapter to verse 12. This one is quite clear as well. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my, and, and my new name. And then last of all, in chapter three and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Notice verse 21. 
he who overcomes, I will grant to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, while all of those uh, privileges that are listed here in these two chapters, as I said, are really quite difficult to explain. If you're interested in getting some of the ideas, you can read commentaries on the book of the Revelation. I, have, I still find them after all these years kind of difficult to really explain them. But I do know that this is referring to special privileges. So the rewards will be special privileges. Secondly, they will be special honors. And those honors are really described in the New Testament in terms of crowns. And probably you remember that there are five crowns that are listed in the New Testament. And the word crown that's used in each of those instances is a very interesting word. There's two words in the New Testament that can be translated crown. One is the word diadem, and that's the one that's used of the Lord Jesus. But the other one is the word stephanos, and that's the, that's the word that's used in all of these five crowns that are listed. And the word stephanos was in those early days in the, in the games of the first century, they were, they were like a wreath. Uh, if you go to Hawaii, and if they like you and you're leaving, they'll put what they call a lay around your neck. It's like a wreath they put around your neck. And so Paul is using that kind of analogy to say that in that future day, there will be special honors because crowns are extended in honor to those who have earned them. And we don't have time to look at all of those, but as you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, for those who are self-controlled during the course of their lifetime, he gives them a crown of mastery. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the crown of rejoicing. And that one's really easy to explain because the crown of rejoicing are the Thessalonian saints. And so when Paul got home to heaven and Thessalonians were, were, saints were there, they were his crown. That was like an honor to them because he'd had the privilege of preaching the gospel to them. Second Timothy 4, the crown of righteousness. James 1, uh, the crown of life. And First Peter chapter 5, verse 4, obviously is dealing with the rewards that are given to elders. And that one is, that is a very select crown that's given to a very select group of individuals, men who have served well as, um, as elders in the assembly. And then last of all, there will be special responsibilities. And I take it that the word reign has more to do with authority than, than the whole concept of honoring and the whole concept of privileging. So this, the, these special responsibilities refer to assisting the Lord Jesus in ruling over the earth. That is that those who are faithful will actually indeed be a joint participant in his future reign. But not only for the messianic kingdom, but think about it, even into eternity. So if we're ruling and reigning, it means we're going to be working. He's going to assign responsibilities to his people and all of it will depend upon the way we live now. And that's why Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We will be recompensed according to the deeds done in the body, that is, in these bodies of ours are earthly bodies, whether they be good or whether they be bad. So that is the future that God has for all of us. He's offering to us the privilege and responsibility to reign with him in that future kingdom. We're all going to be in the kingdom, but there may be a bit of a question as to whether there will be some who will not be rewarded. But on the other end, there could be true, as Dr. Ironside said, that all, every believer, the Lord will find something for which he can reward them. You probably have heard this story, but I, I think it's really the mar a marvelous thought that the Lord Jesus would choose in grace to say to us, if you'll be faithful to me, I'm not obligated to reward you, but in my grace, I want to reward you. And I want you to be a joint participant with me in my future kingdom. The story is told, maybe you've heard this before, about the man and woman who had a young son. And uh, sadly, the mother died. And so the father was left with looking after the young man. 
but unfortunately, uh, the father died, or the son died. And so the man was left alone. He was a very wealthy man. He had a huge palatial mansion that uh, Art had brought in from Europe, hanging all over his living room. But he had one painting that someone had painted of his son. And after the wife died, um, this man brought in a woman to, I don't know if she was called a maid or not, but she was brought in to look after this little boy. And so as she took care of him, she grew to love him as if the little guy was her own son. Well, eventually the father died, the, the son died, and then the father died. But unfortunately, there was no will. And so they had to auction off all of the man's possessions. And the story goes that on the day of the auction, a lot of art dealers came uh, because they were interested in the art the man had purchased. But the very first thing the auctioneer auctioned off was a picture of his son. Now, the picture of his son was nothing in comparison with Van Gogh and some of the other paintings that the man had in his living room. So none of the art dealers were interested in that. But sitting in the back was this woman who had looked after this little guy for a period of time. She had very little money, but she offered to give him what she had. And because no one else, you know, bid for the, for the painting, she took the painting and went home. After she got home, she was looking at the painting and she turned it over. And right down on the right hand corner of the back of the, of the painting was a little note. And she pulled it off and opened it up. And these are the words she read. I bequeath all of my possessions to the person who loved my son enough to buy this painting. I bequeath all of my possessions to the person who loved my son enough to buy this painting. I see in that a bit of a reflection of what the Lord Jesus wants to do in that future kingdom. If we love him in this life, we seek to be faithful to him. He will extend this great privilege of reigning with him, given responsibilities. Dr. Merle Longer says that those, and I think this is probably true, he suggested that these rewards will mean occupying executive and administrative offices as we rule in that future kingdom. Now that's not Ron Hubbard stuff. This is coming directly uh, from the Lord Jesus. So you and I can be challenged this morning that in that future day that he wants us to reign with him. And could I just, I think I have a couple of my, just a couple other thoughts that have been coming to my mind this week. One is this, that you know, sometimes in the Christian life, we get kind of discouraged with who we are. And I, sometimes I, I feel that way myself. I get a little bit disheartened with myself, and I'm sure we all do. But, you know, one of the things that was pointed out to me earlier this week, which was a, just a really curse to me, is that no matter where we are in life, God deals with us where we are. And the, the man who was talking about this was using Elijah in the Old Testament as an example. Here was Elijah who had, had this great victory on Mount Carmel, but then Jezebel says, you know, by tomorrow you're going to be dead like the prophets. So he flees, he runs to Mount Horeb. And God didn't condemn him for running to Mount Horeb, but God dealt with him exactly where he was. So he met his spiritual need, his emotional need, and even his mental need. I find that a little bit of encouragement, brothers and sisters, that no matter where I'm at, God is going to deal with me right where I'm at. The other thing is this, God deals with us holistically. I, you know, I've done a lot of studies in theology over the years, and I have to tell you, I, I am beginning to question all of these great distinctions we make between body, soul, and spirit. Because when you read through the Bible, God, God deals with people holistically. I find that an encouragement as well. So, you know, you and I don't need to be discouraged as we face life and all of its problems and maybe the way we might feel about ourselves. God will deal with us right where we're at and he will deal with us holistically. And in that coming day, when he assigns these responsibilities, he will do it impartially and righteously. 
so you and I can be faithful to him in this life. Uh, there's a story to close, and I have two minutes, I can finish with this one. Uh, you've maybe heard this story too about the, this wealthy Raja, I think this came from India. The wealthy Raja was driving down the road in this uh, chariot, and he sees this beggar man standing, uh, standing on the side of the road, so he stops. Because the beggar man wants the rich man, or the wealthy Raja, to give him some of his rice. Uh, but instead, the Raja asked him for some of his rice. And the beggar man thought, why? You know, it, it angered him. Why does he want my rice? He's got plenty himself. He could give me some. But he reluctantly gave him some rice. The wealthy man said, well, give me more of your rice. And the beggar man was really, really angry then. So he gave him more rice, and then he turned, away, uh, turned and walked away. As he was walking away, he was looking at the rice bowl. And he thought he saw something glisten in the rice bowl. So he began to stir his finger around. There was a little piece of gold that appeared in the rice. He fingered a little more in the rice bowl, and he turned up more little pieces of gold. And he suddenly realized that for every grain of rice that he gave the wealthy Raja, the Raja gave him a grain of, of gold in return. You and I can be like that beggar man. Whatever we give to the Lord, if we give it to him because we love him, he will reward us in the coming day. Don't you find that encouraging? I think it really, really is encouraged. And while again, you know how it will all play out in the future kingdom, we'll have to wait and see what that will be like. But I thank him for his mercy and grace to offer that we can share with him in that future kingdom. Father, we can hardly believe that you love us so much that you would be willing not only to die for us, but to give us a place in your future kingdom. And Lord, you know each of us, you know our hearts, you know how we struggle, you know how difficult life can be for us. But we know that you're looking at our hearts, and you're looking at our motives. And we just sincerely pray that you'll give us the strength of your spirit to be faithful to you each day. And when we fail, Lord, we know that we can get right back up and continue in the Christian life by your grace. So we again thank you for the great privilege of being able to serve you in that future day. Bless us today, we pray, as we separate and as we begin a new week. Help us to honor you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.